We're going to look at some major injury news in just a moment. Plus, we're going to talk all about Bo Nix and diagnosing his issues through two weeks so far. But speaking of the offense, who do you think is more to blame? Bo Nix, Sean Payton, or we'll say the run game because that's been awful. Let me know in the comment section below while this intro video rolls. I want to get the pulse of all of Broncos country. For the fourth time since 2019, the Broncos start the season off 0-2. Back-to-back years under Sean Payton, opening up the season winless. It's not easy to make the playoffs when you start the year off 0-1. Since they expanded to a 14-team playoff, only 26% of teams have made the playoffs when losing in Week 1. And you don't want to know the percentage of teams that make the playoffs when starting off 0-2. So, Let's get into some injury news, and then we'll talk all about Bo Nix and this offense. But really quickly, Mike McGlinchey is out for the next few weeks, probably a month, and likely a candidate for a short-term IR stint with an MCL knee sprain, according to Mike Garofolo. Obviously, it goes without saying, this is a big bummer. The offensive line was already shaky through the first two weeks. I don't think they were as bad as some other people were making them out to be. But losing your starting right tackle for what's probably going to be four weeks, I mean, that's what a lot of people are saying right now, but nothing confirmed or absolute yet. Still, losing McGlinchey is definitely a gut punch because you already had, I mean, Luke Wattenberg, not trying to pick on anyone individually here, but a new center in there, and then Garrett Bowles has not gotten off to an excellent start to the year, so you really wanted to lean on your number one free agent signing from last offseason, the $86 million right tackle, and when we look at Bron- uh, the Denver Broncos offensive line, without McGlinchey, it's probably going to be Matt Peart or Alex Palchewski. Now, looking ahead here, Denver has a tough four upcoming games in terms of like the opponent's pass rush. Yaya Diaby and the Buccaneers' front five is formidable. Uh, The New York Jets always have a really good defense. The Raiders with Max Crosby and Christian Wilkins are a team to watch for. Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa from the Chargers. Like, if you don't have McGlinchey for those four games, it was already tough with him and without him and... Probably Matt Peart starting, former third round pick by the Giants out of UConn. He's got a load of uh, bunch load, excuse me, a bunch of starts in his NFL career with the Giants. So the more experienced guy between him and Palchewski, who was a UDFA last year out of Illinois, that pretty much redshirted his entire freshman year in the NFL after sitting on IR for much of it. So I would expect Matt, Matt Peart to get the start at right tackle as long as McGlinchey is out. But of course. Losing your right tackle is concerning or either tackle for your quarterback and his protection and health. But I'm more concerned about McGlinchey's absence in the run game. It was already bad, and I don't think this is one of those additions by subtractions. I think McGlinchey was one of the few bright spots they had in terms of the ground game, which basically has no bright spots. Look at the rushing stats so far for Denver. Javante Williams, hand up, is far and away wildly underperforming so far this year and no one's been any better like Tyler Beatty one carry for 16 yards yesterday that's literally the lone bright spot through two weeks on the ground I guess Bo Nix has had a couple of scrambles but I mean that's not traditional design runs that's more of improvisation and finding a couple of holes in the defense and exploiting it and running over a bunch of green grass until the defense crashes in on you But Javante Williams has been the focal point of this ground game so far. And I think he might just be broken. I think it might just be one of those really sad instances where he never really bounced back after the injury. I was a believer in Javante Williams going into this season. Two years removed from his knee injury. Contract year. Running backs always tend to be a little bit faster when you've got some money hanging out in front of them like a new contract. But Javante Williams is just not seeing the field well. There's not good good cuts being made. I think he might ultimately just be broken, but I don't think it there I don't think there's a better option right now on this team. Like Jaleel McLaughlin hasn't done much better in his spot. So ultimately I think this ground game just needs to get completely torn to shreds and start all over, which is not easy to do once the season gets underway. U- ultimately, I think the execution is bad on its own. Like, just the X's and O's, the Jimmy's and Joe's from that standpoint. But the play calling and Bo Nix, they have not helped this ground game whatsoever. 
Josh Reynolds spoke to the media today, and he didn't want to take all the heat, so he kind of pointed to the lack of a ground game hurting the passing game. And while that's true, like the lack of a passing game is also hurting the ground game. Look what this tweet has to say from Jordan Lopez. The Broncos went against a stacked box at the third highest rate in Week 2 at 36.8%. The top team that saw the most were the Saints, 41%. Biggest difference from the Saints to the Broncos. New Orleans went play action 58% of the time. Denver went play action 13% of the time. This is just archaic, right? This is on play calling. This is what I was just talking about a moment ago, where, yeah, the execution from the offensive line and the running backs is not good. But what's also not helping is they are facing a stacked eight-man box and the offensive play calling from Sean Payton is doing nothing to help with that. Not incorporating very or any play action whatsoever to at least make the defense think you could be passing for a moment to get them to back up a little bit. And then the defense itself is stacking the box because they don't respect Bo Nix as a deep threat passer. They think everything's going to be short and underneath. And the biggest threat to the defense is the ground game. So they are completely neutralizing that because they don't think Bo Nix can beat them through the year. Do you see? Do you, do you all see how this is unfortunately a perfect like triangle of death? Like execution is bad. Play calling is bad. Quarterback play is bad. And they all just make each other worse. That's the real issue here. Now, next up on the show, I want to talk more about Bo Nix in diagnosing why the rookie quarterback has not gotten off to a fruitful start. First, I do want to fill everyone watching in about our great sponsor, though, and that would be Game Time. If you're trying to go catch a Broncos game, a Rockies game, a Nuggets game, or an Avs game, you're going to want to listen up because Game Time has an awesome new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets today with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CHATSPORTS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but again, create an account and redeem code CHAT SPORTS for $20 off. I put all that information in the comments and description of today's video. Go support Game Time today. They're a huge supporter of us here at Chat Sports, so I would really appreciate it if you do, if you are thinking of going to a game to check out Game Time. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Let's talk about Bo Nix. Okay. For starters, anyone watching at this point probably already has a predetermined opinion on Bo Nix. And it's probably one of two things. One, you like Bo Nix, you like the draft pick, so you are in the I'm going to defend Bo Nix slash I'm going to remain optimistic and defend Bo Nix for as long as possible because if Bo Nix is bad, then the Broncos are really, really screwed. And I completely understand that part. There's no worse feeling than accepting the first-round pick you made at quarterback is a bust. If you have a Panthers fan, go talk to them. They are going through that right now. So I get that part. The other part, though, is an acknowledgement that Bo Nix has not been good, and a lot of it is his own fault. Now, we can spend a lot of time debating about what percentage of blame you want to divvy up between Nix, Sean Payton, the offensive line, the wide receivers, and the running back. But the reality is Bo Nix has made a lot of mistakes that he has no one else to blame but himself. He's, rookie, he's a rookie quarterback who's played two games so far. So I'm not putting the guy six feet under and saying he can never bounce back or recover from this. But we do have to call a spade a spade. And Bo Nix through two weeks has not been a very good quarterback. So let's talk about what we have seen so far. Um, some good stuff here, okay? More downfield passing. Bo Nix, week one against the Seahawks, became one of 10 quarterbacks to throw the ball more than 40 times for less than 140 yards. That's an extremely low yards per attempt. But look at Bo Nix's uh, passing chart week two against the Seahawks. I'm sorry, week two against the Steelers. And then, oh, this is against the uh, Seahawks. I'm, I'm, I'm getting all turned around. Week one against the Seahawks. And now let's look at it week two against the Steelers. Like, go one more time, Reed. 
I mean, just look where all the green dots are. Pretty close to the blue line, the line of scrimmage. Very few beyond the 10-yard mark. I've got a deep one on the trick play to Josh Reynolds. We are, we are seeing an improvement, okay? It's not a vast, huge step forward, but he went from averaging 3.3 yards per attempt in week one to seven yards in week two. So he essentially doubled his yards per attempt from one week to the next. So that's some good news right there. So more downfield passing and some good downfield passing as well. Here's the bad. Sean Payton could not stand the sacks that Russell Wilson took last year. Nothing made him want to pull his hair out more. Watching the Steelers game yesterday, there were two sacks in the first half that just felt like phantom sacks. The second one where TJ Watt kind of just like tags his ankle slash Achilles. And then the first one, Bo Nix just kind of stumbles in the pocket. You just can't go down that easily. Like every job in the NFL is extremely difficult. The offensive line have a very difficult job going up against these extremely fast and strong defensive linemen. Same goes for defensive linemen going up against 300-pound linemen who are way too fast for that size. But Bo Nix has to be a harder target to hit in the pocket. And I would say watching two weeks so far, and especially on Sunday, he has just been too easy of a sack. It just can't be that simple for the defense to tap his ankle on the way down and go, that's enough to dislodge his balance and knock him on the ground. It's not going to be a good season if Bo Nix goes down that easily. Now, the worst part about Bo Nix through two weeks has to be the interceptions. They are bad, right? There are interceptions that rookies make that, hey, you can go back and watch the film and you can correct that and hopefully that is made here. But the interceptions are bad. Let's go to Bo Nix's first interception against the Seahawks in the first half. He has just released the football as I snapped this picture. And you can kind of see what Bo Nix is thinking here. Hey, if I layer this between the defender at the eight-yard line and the safety at the goal line, I can get this ball to Cortland Sutton, who's probably going to get inside the five and maybe score a touchdown. Now, in Nix's defense... Sutton does not work his way back to the football. It's almost as if he does not think there's a safety behind him, and he's just waiting to catch this ball in the end zone, so the safety jumps it and picks it off. So I think some blame here can be placed on Cortland Sutton, but this is a learning moment for Bo Nix. This is one of those, oh, this is not college football, because maybe in college the safety wouldn't make that play. In the NFL, they will make that play. So that's one of those picks where you go, hey, that's a rookie interception. That's a learning moment that in the preseason, you got away doing that because you were playing guys who are now plumbers and electricians. In the NFL, in the regular season, they're not. And they're going to make you pay if you think you can squeeze it in that tight of a window with not enough velocity on that football, which Bo Nix does not have a crazy strong arm. Second interception against the Seahawks. This one is one where you look at and go, uh-oh. What are we doing here? I can kind of understand how the first one happened. Thought he could squeeze it in a tight window. Sutton doesn't run a great route coming back to the football. This one, he just throws it to two defenders. I mean, Cortland Sutton is just flat out double teamed. Look at Marvin Mims, by the way, at the 25-yard line. That's where the football should be going. Like, he is going to run himself into an open pocket of grass and field. But no, Bo Nix, I think, predetermines on the bootleg here, on the play fake, that he wants to go with Cortland Sutton. And this is just one of the easiest interceptions the defender is going to make. Now, fast forward to week two on Sunday, where Bo Nix in the red zone just has to be more protective with the football. Now, what does that mean? When you get into the red zone, something that gets lost is, hey, there is actually another defender introduced. It's the back sideline, right? When you're at your 50-yard line, there is no extra defender, right? There's 11 on the field, and then there's two imaginary defenders, which make up the sideline. When you get into the red zone, you've got that third defender for the defense, which is the back sideline, okay? So for Knicks, he has to know, well, everything's going to be compressed now because the defense knows Cortland Sutton can't run 20 yards down the field. So he loses track of the safety, and I kind of think that Bo Nix just doesn't see him at all because if you look at like the two-yard line, Nix has a receiver staring right at him and a defender behind him, and they kind of perfectly screen that safety in the background. So ultimately, I think Bo Nix just doesn't see this defender, but he has to know pre-snap, okay, 
it's not going to be able to, it's not going to be open in the back because there's going to be that third defender, which is the sideline, and a safety. So even if I see a guy running across, I have to know that there is a defender there, even if I can't see him. Like that's a very difficult thing for a quarterback to grasp initially, but it just has to be made. So through two weeks so far, is it fair to worry about Bo Nix? I'm worried. It has not been good. You can chalk up a lot of excuses to offensive line play and run play, but when I see those interceptions, that's not on the ground game. That's just Bo Nix making a bad decision, a bad mistake. And he's made a lot of them in only two weeks so far. Now, hopefully they can get corrected. But yeah, I am worried. I don't think he is done. I think it's too early to reach that conclusion. But I think we can fairly say it has not been good and you have every right to be concerned right now. So, Bo Nix through two weeks, ultimately I don't think is done or like like I said earlier, six feet under, but it's not ideal. <laughs> and that's putting it lightly. So hopefully we can see better play calling, an improvement in the ground game, and that just kind of alleviates some of the pressure from Bo Nix, take a little bit off of his plate, let him get some more reps and um, experience under his belt, and then we could talk about adding more on in a couple of months towards December. But for now, they have to pull back on Bo Nicks. It's just not working having him throw the ball this much so far.